This is the Vegas Huddle with Mike Davis. What's up, guys? Welcome inside the den for the Vegas Huddle. I'm your host, Mike Davis. Today we got a really special guy in the den, in the huddle with us. This guy, he's not only a former NBA player, he also is a Vegas guy. Yeah, he actually went to Bishop Gorman. We're going to be talking all about growing up here in Vegas and just his whole career and now all the great stuff he's doing for our community. I got to introduce you guys to C.J. Watson. C.J. Watson, great to be with you. Um, you're a Vegas guy. You grew up here, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. how crazy is it to see the way, the landscape of Vegas sports now? Uh, it's crazy, man. I feel like uh, when I was growing up here, they said we would never get a sports team or pro sports team, and now we have, you know, several, and it's definitely cool for the city. Uh, I definitely root for all the Vegas teams, and definitely, like I, said, like I said earlier, just a little bit jealous that I'm not able to play for maybe an NBA team one day, but definitely happy for the city. It's a, it's a great thing, especially now having the Ignite and everything that's going on with them, but let's, you know, before we get into your whole career, because you really played for a lot of interesting teams, yeah. and you played everywhere, um, but Let's talk about your time at Gorman. So growing up, I mean, you were pretty a pretty spectacular athlete, I would imagine. Were you playing a little bit of everything? Were, were you how focused in on basketball were you, or were you playing every sport? Uh, no, I was all focused in on basketball. By the time I got to Gorman, uh, I played like you know um, baseball when I was younger, but uh, it was too hot uh, outside, obviously here in Vegas. And then uh, I played outfield, so my we had a pretty good pitcher, a pitcher. Uh, never gave up any hits, so I was kind of bored out there. So I just wanted to go back inside to the air condition. But once I, once I got to Gorman, I was definitely all focused on basketball, and uh, you know I'm just definitely grateful to be able to have a chance to go to a, a good school like that. Um, you know, and uh, meet the people that I met, and uh, have the teammates and people around me. And when you're playing at Gorman, tell us about your years in high school. I mean, uh, you know, you end up going to you know play for the Tennessee Volunteers, but yeah. at Gorman, I mean, what type of player were you? Were you, uh, I mean, just dominating on a daily basis? What, what what was it like? No, so it was crazy. So my freshman year, I came in with a lot of hype. I feel like, uh, but I got injured. I didn't play the whole freshman year. Uh, tore my hamstring, so I had to sit out. So I, I think that gave me a lot of initiative and drive to come back my sophomore year, prove to people that I was, you know, worthy of all the little hoopla, or whatever. And then uh, also just to get a get a spot on the team because I, I was going to uh, to varsity, so I had to be able to play with bigger guys, stronger guys, and uh, just taking that summer to get stronger, get healthier, and then just make my way onto the team. And uh, sophomore year, uh, we won state. Uh, then next year, I wanted to come back and do the same thing. Uh, junior year, I won state for the year. Um, and then sophomore or senior year, I won the state championship also in the player of the year. So I was just de just determined to be the best I could be. And your game, you know, because uh, me thinking about all the times I watched you in the NBA and playing in the league, you know, you always were a crafty player, you yeah. know, and you had a lot of interesting, you know, that's why I, I was researching you. I saw that you chose 32 for Magic. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, you kind of were reminiscent of Magic in a lot of ways because you were crafty and can do a little bit – of everything, um, your game at Gorman. I mean, it was. Were you always this type mm -hmm. of player? Because a lot of guys, they have to kind of alter their game. You know, yeah. we've seen it. Whereas, like, you know, a Vince Carter is a high flying dunker kind right. of guy. But then, in order to, you know, uh, make sure he has the longevity in his NBA career, he becomes like, you know, a three point, you know, yeah. shooter kind of guy. Yeah. So we see that even Ray Allen, guys like that. So how was your game? You know, from Gorman to then. You know, seeing how we actually maturing through you know Tennessee to the to the league. Uh, so growing up on in uh, on the west side of Vegas, I just uh, was taught about defense. That was mostly all I was taught about was defense. So that's kind of what I hung my hat on was defense. Uh, if you go back and look at my stats in high school, you would see I get like ten or twelve steals a game, which is kind of rare. But um, I was definitely a scorer in high school, like a slasher. But as I got to college and to the pros had to adjust because I was playing with better players and uh, playing with players who can score the ball better than me. So I just kind of adapted. I was always a pure point guard, so I feel like it was always something in me to be able to get my teammates uh, their shots, but I, I can also score also. Now let's talk about defense because, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I know when you finished at – Tennessee, you were second all time in assists and second all time in steals, yeah. which is a great stat. But to me, defense is all about effort, right? Yeah, yeah for sure, yeah. You know, and it's <laughs> like some of these guys, they just don't play defense. <laughs> you know, like to me, I saw Kyrie in high school and I was like, man, this guy right. has maybe the best handles I've ever seen, yeah. right? But he doesn't play defense, yeah. you know? So tell us what that's like. Is a Kyrie just not interested in playing defense or? 
and it's just a pure effort thing, or he actually lacks the ability to play good defense? No, I think he definitely can play defense. <laughs> I think, uh, obviously, he's such a talented scorer now, and definitely when you get to the NBA, it's two different things. Um, I think they really have you really have Kyrie score the ball than play defense. So and I mean, so, so what does that mean? You're telling me like an actual coach because you played for some guy. I mean, you played for Don Nelson. Yeah, I know yeah. he's not letting a guy yeah. not play defense. Yeah, yeah. But do some coaches you think in the NBA just say like, oh, like Kyrie, if you're dropping thirty, like we'll pick up the slack on D. Don't worry about playing D. Yeah, I think you definitely have to pick and choose your spots, especially in the pro level. Uh, like say, like his teammate Luca. Would you rather Luca play defense or score forty? Well, yeah. is it too much to ask for both? No, it's not too much to ask. <laughs> Just the new day and age of our of our game, you know. And uh, a lot of players don't play two ways anymore. And. I would say, like I said, it's just like you said, it's about effort, and um, most people, especially at that level, you don't really have to do both. You do one or the other. Just do what you're good at, and they're good at scoring the basketball. <laughs> wow, it's so fascinating because I feel like, and our world is becoming like that. It seems like it's becoming more specialized. Yeah. Where I remember back in the day, like you know, these guys were well-rounded players. Right. Ron Harper, yeah, you yeah, know, like he sure, can do yeah. a little bit of everything, yeah, or an yeah. Andre Miller, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're playing all aspects of the game and now it's like we're seeing specialists yeah. really in the forefront well, how do you feel about that from an athletic standpoint i mean the game has definitely changed i think i mean i don't like it uh, also per se but uh for the uh development of the game for the future of the game i think you're going to see more people like wimby come who are seven four seven three to be able to handle right. the ball shoot the basketball um and be able to block shots like he does so i think it's definitely going to change the atmosphere of the game but you know, it's still the game is still fun to watch. I feel like, and uh, as long as that that's happened, I mean, yeah. I think it'd be fun. <laughs> so you end up going to, uh, you know, from Gorman, you go to uh, Tennessee, mm -hmm. and I was reading that you so you had you went you had a lot of trips, yeah, to Tennessee as a youngster because you had family in the yeah. area. So how big of a role did that play in really choosing Tennessee? Where where were you thinking after Gorman? Uh, so I wanted to go. My dream school was UCLA. Uh, so I went to unofficial visit with my some of my AU teammates at UCLA. Um, and that was like, I was like, hey, I'm locked in. I'm going here because I'm good enough. I, I like the coach. I love the city. I love L.A. Then the coach got fired. So I was just like, I'll just open up my what coach was that? Uh, Steve Levin. Oh, and every yeah. time I see him to this day, he's like, I wish I would have stayed and signed you. But, you know, it is what it is. It worked out, I guess, good. But um, my family was always from there. We would drive from here to Tennessee, long trips in a, in a van with my family and my cousins. So. I definitely was used to Tennessee. I'm not really a country kid, but uh, I definitely loved it, and uh, that's probably one of the reasons that I went to. I signed to Tennessee. See, and what your time there? I mean, uh, four years. I mean, which is yeah. rare to yeah, play yeah. four seasons there. But how much did you see your game grow in the SEC and playing in that program? A lot, because that's one of the best conferences in the nation. I feel like uh, every night is a different competition. Every night somebody can beat you. And uh, I was going up against, you know, I was a skinny 165-pound kid going against guys who are 200 and 190 in my position. So it was definitely good to get me ready for the next level, I feel like. And um, I definitely grew each and every year, especially scoring. Who was the coach there during that? Uh, Buzz Peterson was my, was my coach the first three years, and Bruce was my Bruce Pearl, Pearl yeah. last year, yeah. And what was he like? Bruce was fun, man. He was a uh, he was a character. He's uh, I, I just texted him a couple weeks ago, but he's always good to me. Um, he was definitely gave me the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do and play an up and down system, which I was used to playing growing up here in Vegas and watching the Rebels and stuff like that. So uh, he was definitely opened my game to different heights. And did you think? Because you, I think, at one season you were averaging like 15 a game. Yeah, my last year. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think would it have behooved you to go leave earlier, like a lot of kids do now, where they play one or two? Two years right. in the NBA and go straight to the draft because you ended up having a great NBA career, but you were undrafted yeah. out of Tennessee and you had to go to Greece and Italy and right. do a bunch of different stops. So, do you think you know staying long hurt you in the long run? Uh, I don't think so. So, a lot of people don't know this. I was actually going to leave my junior year. So, me and my parents met with the agent and everything, and, and especially with my coach getting fired, I was like, I don't want to stay. I don't want to go through a rebuild. So. We were thinking about leaving. Uh, we went through the whole process of uh, declaring my name and stuff like that. But Bruce kind of convinced me to come back. And he was like, you're going to have the best year ever. I'm going to let you come out here and play the way I know you can play and the way you want to play, which is like up and down, run and gun system. So and like I said, I, I trusted his word. Uh, I believed him and it, it worked out. <laughs> See, yeah, and you ended up really having a great season. Yeah. Um, but then you end up, you know, getting undrafted. And how, how did that feel? I mean, because you probably felt like I can contribute yeah, yeah. to the next level right away. Yeah. I thought I had a lot of great workouts coming in, um, uh, going to the draft. Um, definitely disappointed. Uh, I think that made me work even more harder. Um, just had a chip on my shoulder to go out there and prove that I can play in the NBA. And then playing my first year overseas, it was just it was just hard. It was different. Uh, I didn't know any language or 
right. uh, anything Italian. So I was just <laughs> trying to go out there and just play and learn my game and, and grow. Thankfully, I had a couple of teammates, Ricky Menard and Mike Pimberth, who played in the NBA before. And they kind of taught me a lot about the overseas basketball game and just to be ready for the, the program also when I get my chance. Yeah, because you know what's so – because and I think that's why this is going to tie in so nicely with everything you're doing, you know, with Quiet Storm mm -hmm. and, you know – in the books that you're writing for kids because to me the determination to get to the NBA yeah. after not having that initial path right off the bat the way that you probably hoped it yeah. you know so many guys get stuck in that because they're the best player that's always right. you know they've always been the best at their high school they've yeah, always yeah. been <laughs> the best you know even when they get to college and then they don't get that off the out of the gate they don't have the right. start that they want to have but they have something, an ability within that keeps them going. Like, uh, you know, Amir Johnson was in here in the same chair that you're sitting in, and he spoke about that. And right. having these longevity and these this type of career, it, there's something special about that. Because did you have times when you're overseas, you're not speaking a language, <laughs> it's not exactly what you thought for yourself initially. Yeah. How do you dig deep within and, you know, look within to keep – mustering up that effort so you're eventually going to get to where you want to be uh just my belief in god i feel like and uh, just having a great uh, parents and surrounding circle um they always kept pushing me even there were times where i wanted to give up and quit and just come back home and like i said just start working but uh they kept telling me this is what you work for this is your calling uh, you put all the work in to, to get here so don't stop now uh, you know and uh, i think that like i said it's just that belief and uh belief they had in me and when times i didn't have it in myself so that, that was the biggest thing do you think a lot of guys, because, I mean, it's overseas basketball is tough, but there's yeah. a lot of guys who could probably not phone it in, right. but they can kind of go through the motions yeah. of just being a professional athlete overseas and just kind of give up right. on, does that happen, you think, with a lot of these guys who should probably have better careers at the end of the day, but they lack that effort? Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, if, you don't, if you're just overseas and you're not having a lot of people push you and uh, someone's saying in your ear all the time, you know, telling you to, to stay dedicated, to stay uh, pushing yourself to, to get better. I feel like you can get complacent, and I think that's what a lot of guys do, especially if athletes. And um, But I, like I said, I just have that great support system to never let me be complacent and always just put my best foot forward. And then when you finally end up, you know, from there you go to Rio Grande Vipers, but you end up, you know, your first entry really into the NBA was with the Warriors, yeah. right, in 08. Yeah. And this is pretty cool because the team before that <laughs> – was that loaded team that everybody talks yeah, yeah. about the Warriors we when the Warriors, yeah. <laughs> right, when they beat the became the first like eight seed ever to beat a one seed yep. in the playoffs against Dallas. So you go into that system with Don Nelson and they got, you know, Steven Jackson yeah. and Beadrins and yep. Baron Davis and Monta Ellis and all those, you know, cool guys. Tell me what it was like to finally get that call up and, and be in that room and now be on an NBA team. Oh uh, man, it was crazy. It was so fun because uh, like I said I've Watched Baron play in uh, in high school. I watched him play in college, um, and we had UCLA actually, guy. Yeah, UCLA. I, I that's probably one of the reasons I wanted to go to UCLA. And uh, we actually had the same trainer um, oh. also. So uh, it was just crazy because I always play play with him on the video games also. <laughs> and then now I'm in practice touching him, you know, and not not uh, in a bad way, but <laughs> <laughs> no. just you know being able to touch him right. and talk to him and be friends with him and uh, still be friends with him to this day. And guys like him and Al Al Harrington, uh, Monte Ellis. Um, um, who else? Uh, just Coach Nelson was just so cool. Uh, he had a nice, a great system where you would play up and down and uh, just let you play play free. And you really, I mean, at what point do you, you get into the league, you're playing on these teams, when do you finally have, you always had the confidence you yeah. could be there, but when do you start kind of knowing it and yeah. like, okay, I, I deserve to be here, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. When do you start feeling that? I think the confidence started like in uh, Summer League after that year, because uh, that year I didn't really play a lot. I played like maybe five or ten minutes and then, uh, coach would play me for like 10 games and stuff like that. So uh, I think that next year came around when I was actually doing pretty well, being consistent, uh, maybe getting eight or 10 points a night. So I think that was just the biggest confidence booster, just putting all the seeing all the work that I put in the summertime right. and translate into the game, you know, uh, that season. And then, you know, throughout your career, I mean, you know, you go to the Bulls for a couple of years, you went to the Nets, Pacers, Magic. But what was the biggest, you know, the biggest jump in play? What did you recognize mm -hmm. from – you know, from Gorman to Tennessee to overseas to the NBA. I mean, when it gets to the NBA, what is the difference maker between these teams and the level of play? Uh, just the guys that can, how they can recover so fast. You know, these guys are 6'9", 6'10", can move, can shoot, can jump. And uh, just the athleticism of the guys, uh, it's way different from overseas. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and then just 
uh, the travel, I think, is the biggest part of the NBA. You travel on a, a jet every night uh, <laughs> and fly private. So I think that's the biggest thing. Overseas, you're taking buses all the time, three or four hour trips. So right. that's a little different. It's kind of hard on your back, you know. But uh, overall, I think the NBA is the, is the best, the best job ever. And the co- on the court, so on the court, didn't the cha- the challenge wasn't so much. It, you felt it was pretty easy the transition yeah. to the NBA. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think the from high school to college was a big jump, but uh, from college to the pros isn't isn't that big because the athletes in in college are just as big as the NBA, if not bigger. Wow. And then I mean, all these stints, and when you're you know going throughout the league, what do you when you're when teams are looking to add you onto mm-hmm. the roster? Why do you think? Teams were like, man, we want we want C.J. Watson on this roster. What what was it that you were bringing to these franchises? Um, just like you said, uh, I wasn't a great player. or one, Not one thing stood out. I can just do everything. That's what I practiced on and trained on all the time was doing everything, uh, at least, you know, to a, a good standard uh, so I can shoot, I could pass, I could dribble, um, play defense. So uh, in my calling was just coming off the bench. So if I can come off the bench and give you that energy that you need, uh, get you some points, get you some defense and – uh, my goal was whole, my whole goal when I played uh, was not to lose the lead. If we had the lead, and if we didn't have the lead, try to get the lead back for our starter to come and take it home. Right. So that was kind of like my goal, my thesis every night. You were backing up a lot, like Bulls backing up Rose, yeah, right, yeah. and Darren Williams, yeah, yeah. With, you know, all-star the point guard. So it was, was right. kind of hard, and I didn't really play a lot, so I had to make sure I make my time uh, efficient every night. <laughs> um, what was it like playing? I mean, you see those guys. I mean. You know, you're saying, man, I used to play with Baron Davis in the video games, yeah, yeah. 2K and NBA Live, all those games. Now you're up close and personal with these guys. Who was the one guy you just could not believe mm-hmm. how talented this guy was? Like just playing with him, you're you're yeah. freaked out. I would just say Kobe. Uh, Kobe was the main guy who uh, I looked up to, uh, in, like from high school on, and then just to see what he was doing on the NBA court so effortlessly. And then uh, he would talk trash to and uh, just do it to, to, to everyone, the, the fans, the refs, uh, the other coach. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was just so fun watching him play and how he dictated the whole game. Do you think, like, I mean, do you actually need a few possessions just to, like, get a handle of yourself and to realize, oh, like, crap, I'm playing. Uh, just Brian. the first time ever. <laughs> but after that, it was, it was kind of yes. normal after that. Uh, everyone else just seemed like, you know, bluff to me after that. So... Um, I think uh, that first time definitely was like, you know, I got had to pinch myself and say, I, I'm really on the court with Kobe. What did he say to you? Uh, nothing really, because I had to guard in one possession. And he just, you know, just said, throw the ball here because this is a mismatch. <laughs> <laughs> so it was definitely uh, definitely a little disrespectful, but I, I, I can uh, I can attest that it was probably called for. <laughs> and who are some of the other guys maybe that like, we wouldn't, we wouldn't anticipate that they were like outstanding, but somebody who shocked you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say uh, Steve Nash was always, uh, I think, one of the best point guards I played against, and also Tony Parker. Uh, yeah. They were two of the best, hardest to guard point guards, and um, uh, I think those two guys are on the top of my list and like any point guard list. Wow. And from a coaching perspective, I mean, Scott Skiles, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Thibodeau, uh, Vogel, right, yeah, yeah. with the Pacers, Don Nelson. So what did you learn? Who did you kind of, uh, I guess, mesh with the best and what did you learn from that person Um, i would say uh probably coach thibodeau he uh he was just a hard-nosed driven guy he always had us prepared uh so every time we had to go out and play an opponent we there was nothing we didn't know about them we knew all their plays um and he the games are more the practices more harder than the games so the games (laughs) seem easy so we were we were dreading practice as as players but really it became easy because the practices were so hard and like i said he just had it prepared to the t and that's why we were so good Wow, and because he he's notoriously, I mean, it's t- he loves vets. You yeah, know? Yeah, 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 and yeah, he hated he hated rookies. <laughs> and I, so it's a lot of it is because he really has a real hard nosed approach to practice. Yeah, and that's all. That's, that's why his life he doesn't have a girlfriend or wife or kids <laughs> or anything like that. So he's in the gym twenty four seven, you know, preparing for the next game and the next game after that. And he cared that much more than oh, yeah. the average coach. Oh, he cared. Like I said, 20 times because he wanted to be successful. Obviously, like every coach, but he really put the the time and the due diligence in to to be to be successful. That's shocking. How many NBA guys really care? Like I think um, a lot of them care, but you know, obviously, I mean, you're like care paid. to that level where they like not a lot. Wi- where yeah. winning is like parent, like yeah. they want to win, and it m- means the most to them in the yeah. world. There's very few. Like I said, you have your Kobe's, you have your D Wade's or LeBron's, because those are the guys that are obviously in the Hall of Fame. For a reason, talent, you know, winning, all that kind of stuff. So, like I said, it's very few, but I think everyone wants to win. But obviously, every night it's just so hard to win, and there's so many games and so many things that can go wrong to make you lose a game. What do you think about uh, load management? 
Uh, I think it's needed. Uh, definitely, I think athletes are kind of not running to the ground, but they have to prepare themselves uh, for 82 game season because it's long and uh, with playoffs and stuff like that. Um, but I can see where the fans, you know, want to come see your favorite player play every night, right. especially if you're buying tickets for only that game that they're missing out or sitting out on. So I definitely think uh, players got to play and uh, give the fans what they want. So, yeah, I think I, I agree. Um, but let's talk about, so after your whole career, I mean, what's interesting is you're the type of guy who really would probably be a great coach, you know, because yeah. point guards usually have a good mind right, yeah. for coaching. And especially a guy we're talking about, you know, Coach Hart with yeah. Big Knight and kind of not that you, you were a little bit of a journeyman kind of going around different teams and playing yeah. all over and having to introduce yourself and incorporate yourself into different franchises. Why did you kind of choose to to not really get into coaching so much? Because uh, I had a daughter, so I just wanted to kind of just lay back and just kind of be a daughter. I miss, like, school plays. I miss, you know, um, uh, book reports, stuff like that. So I just wanted to be be a dad for a couple of years, and maybe you never know, down the line I might get back into coaching because I think there's a lot of knowledge that I have to, to give back to the next generation. Yeah. I feel like uh, when I was growing up, a lot of coaches took the time out to give it to me, so only right that I can you know give back to the next generation and uh, help them in some kind of way. So I wouldn't count it out as far as now, but you know, just right now I'm just trying to be a dad and just trying to uh, help them on their journey. And you are helping, though, a lot of people through other ways. Um, let's talk about this. So, first of all, yeah, we, we kind of know your nickname was Quiet Storm. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, so, me and my brother were 16 at the time. Uh, we're going to get a tattoo with my sister in Tennessee. Uh, we were getting the N1 guy in our arm. I didn't know what to, <laughs> I didn't know what to get. And uh, my sister was like, why don't you just get Quiet Storm? Because you're quiet, you're shy, you're reserved. Uh, but your game, when you're in the basketball court, it hits people like a storm because you're so good and stuff like that. So, uh, I said, it, it sounded pretty good. So, I let the guy tattoo it on me and it's kind of stayed with me uh, since then. And then now this has led into the Quiet Storm Foundation. So tell us about what you do with that. Uh, the Quiet Storm Foundation was something that me and my parents uh, had the idea of. Uh, I always wanted to give back to kids. If, like I said, if I ever wanted to, or if I ever uh, made it big or anything like that. So um, just giving back to kids in an underprivileged area where I grew up here in the West Side. Um, we have a free basketball camp every year. We have an out-of-school program we do different events in. Uh, we also have a Black History Essay Contest. Uh, so when I played in the NBA, we would fly kids to whatever city I played in free flight, uh, free limo ride, free hotels for them and their parents. Uh, but now, since I'm retired, we fly them to D.C. every year. So uh, I think it's good for the kids just to be able to write essays and be articulate and hear the, the things that they come up with and diversity that they come up with. Wow. But also get a chance to travel. Because I never, before I played in the NBA or um, flew in any plane, I never flew in a plane to go to any game. So I think it's good for them just to get out and see the world and see different cities and different cultures. Wow. So do, while you were playing, you would actually, they would students would get to fly out yeah, and yeah. how many times did you do that uh, we did uh 10 years oh my god years. yeah it started in uh golden state and we ended it in uh orlando oh that's a great thing and you keep in touch with all i mean the memories from the yeah so many memories uh, like a lot of kids are uh, not grown now but maybe like 20s or whatever so yeah. i see them randomly and they're like oh i went to your basketball camp or whatever it was so much fun or we flew to chicago and watched you play and with the essay contest so it's fun just to hear those things and just hear how you touch people Oh, see, that's a beautiful thing. And then also show us what we got here. So this is CJ's big dream, uh, but you got you got four of these books now. So this is CJ and his magic socks. So yeah. how did this all start? The big dream was the first one, right? Yeah, CJ's big dream was the first one. Uh, it was just an idea I had while standing on the couch. Uh, I was retired. I said, how can I continue to help kids and and also tell my story? So I said, kids need to read, um, and I can maybe put it in a book. So that's kind of how it came about. I called one of my old, old coaches and who's an author, so I, I just said, uh, what can I do to uh, bring this uh, thought process to life? And uh, that's that's kind of what it, what it was. And the CJ's Big Dream was the first one. Uh, CJ's Big Project is the second one. CJ's Big Moment is the third one. And CJ and his Magic Socks is the fourth one. Wow, see, I like that, Magic yeah. Socks. That's what I, I could have used that. That's what I needed for my <laughs> right. basketball career. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and how is that for you? I mean, the process of, you know, uh, you know, being able to, you know, impart wisdom and advice through that kind of, through, you know, to children like you were doing yeah. with a lot of stuff, but now through a book, what's that process been like for you? Uh, it's been so cool. Like I said, I never thought about being an author before, but definitely uh, I think it's needed. Like I said, a lot of people have given me knowledge and given me wisdom throughout my life and kind of believed in me before I even could believe in myself. So I think this is a good way for kids just to get little small tidbits of messages and a uh, little belief in their in their life and uh, just to help them along their journey. What's the biggest thing that you could impart to, you know, if a kid was listening right now or watching, mm -hmm. what would be the biggest thing that they could really take away 
from this that you think could help them in all aspects of life, not just on the court, but off the yeah. court? Uh, just always believing in yourself, um, always uh, taking the time out to dedicate yourself to whatever you want to be in life, or whatever craft it is that you uh, want to do in in, uh, in your future. And uh, just never let anyone tell you no, because you're going to get a lot of no's. I get a lot of no's about the book, about uh, basketball. Uh, so, But always just believing in yourself and uh, never giving up. And how, I mean, I feel like, we hear similar things from a lot of people, but that confidence and that belief in yourself, yeah. does that come from just work and just devotion to your craft? How do you, because you almost like you got to lie to yourself yeah, yeah. almost mm -hmm. before you can have that true confidence. So how do you, how does a youngster develop that confidence? So when they finally are getting those no's, they have the self-confidence self to keep going. How do we build up confidence? Just being consistent. I think that's the biggest thing, um, just getting up every day and uh, doing whatever whatever it is you wanted to do. Uh, for, for me, for example, uh, going to the gym all the time, uh, putting in the work, putting in the practice, um, and uh, just playing against the best competition kind of helped me continue to, to get better and, and see what I need to work on, but also uh, knowing that it's going to be a, a tough road to get there. And uh, like I said, uh, a lot of bumps in the road, but uh, you just got to got to keep rolling over them. <laughs> and then let's also talk about, so the scholarship fund, this is something that you honored your late grandmother with, yep. Mary Watson, right? Tell yep. us about that. Uh, so that was something uh, when my grandma passed, uh, we as a family wanted to try and continue her uh, her wishes. And her, she was super big on education. Every time I would go visit her in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, like during the uh, off time, she would always, first thing she would ask me was never about basketball. It was <laughs> always about, are you getting your homework right? What are the grades looking like? Uh, that was her biggest thing. So she really preached education. And uh, that's what we wanted to do for these kids, uh, trying to give back to them and uh, just give them a, a future knowing that they can be smart and they can do whatever they want to do. See, that's a great thing. So you're busy with a lot of stuff. Um, tell us what, uh, other ways we can, other things you have on the horizon and things you want people to know about you and how just be able to connect with you mm -hmm. on from a local level. Uh, just trying to figure out my next book. I uh, think maybe I have a plan for it already, <laughs> um, but just trying to put it into into play. Um, but also uh, the basketball camp coming up uh, next July for the Quiet Storm Foundation. Um, it's free to all students, boys and girls, fourth, eighth grade. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of really just about it. I love it. Uh, do you think, when do you expect an NBA franchise here in Vegas? Uh, I would say the next couple years for sure. And uh, do you think, I mean, first of all, we got a lot of sports here yeah. going out. Vegas probably, as a guy who grew up here, you know, it's amazing to see the growth. Yeah. Do you think the way this community is taken to the aces, right? Mm -hmm. And how they're killing it and, you know, the Knights and all these different teams. Did you, as a youngster, always dream of this situation? I mean, to have an NBA team yeah. here in Vegas, what is that going to mean for all the future C.J. Yeah. Watsons? Oh, it's going to mean a lot. They can, you know, like I said, do anything they want to do, um, and uh, it's going to give them an extra boost to, to be able to not have to leave their own city, to be able to go in your own city, be able to maybe – you know, go meet uh, a LeBron or, uh, or Chris Paul or Steph Curry at an at event or go watch them play in the game. So I think it's just going to boost their confidence by, you know, a thousand and just help them uh, achieve the, whatever goals they have set for themselves. Yeah, it's pretty special. I can't wait to see it happen. Uh, CJ, tell us, where can we connect with you? Where can everybody just learn more about everything you're doing with Quiet Storm Foundation mm -hmm. and everything? Uh, for the books, you can go to cjpins.com, Quiet Storm Foundation. You can go to quietstormfoundation.org. Uh, then also on Instagram and Twitter, you can follow me on at quietstorm underscore 32. Quiet Storm. Guys, this is... It's been a pleasant quiet storm in here <laughs> today. Not so quiet. It's the great C.J. Watts. And tell us anything else you want to mention to our audience. Uh, just thanks for having me, um, you know, and uh, I root for anything Vegas. And I uh, just can't wait to see the NBA team here and hopefully the Aces pull it off. All right. There you go. The great C.J. Watson. Thanks. thanks for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank Make you. sure you go check out four books here. But uh, he's got another one in mind happening. And did you bring any magic socks for me? I didn't. They were, they were stinky, so you didn't want to. You didn't oh, want me to uh, those. believe me, I could even <laughs> use stinky socks, guys. That's another edition here in the Vegas Huddle. Make sure you watch us on Fox Five and the Silver State Sports and Entertainment Network, and wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm your host, Mike Davis. We'll see you back here in the Den for the Vegas Huddle. Until next time.